And with that, I will hand things over to Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'd like to start by uh, you talking about our uh, land acknowledgement. It's with great gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are indigenous people of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today the community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to the, their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Now tonight, this talk will give a crash course in key invasive species issues in Rensselaer, on the Rensselaer Plateau and how we can manage their impacts to protect the biodiversity and recreational value of our natural areas. This will include current challenges as well as potential issues on the horizon and efforts to prevent or mitigate them. The talk will also cover how you can report invasive species sightings through the IMAP invasive uh, platform uh, to improve our collective understanding of the distribution of invasive species in the region. Addison Kubik, who is our first speaker, uh, grew up wandering the woods of New York's southern tier, which over time grew into a passion for native plants and wildlife. In college, Addison uh, studied conservation biology with a focus in botany and dendrology. Now, he now works as the education and outreach coordinator for the Capital Region Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, sometimes called PRISMA, where he supports conservation work in the Capital Region by providing talks and lectures, hosting workshops and trainings, and leading volunteer events and more. Uh, Mitchell uh, grew up hiking and enjoying the natural areas of the capital region. He studies terrestrial invasive plants in college and now works as the invasive species biologist for the New York Natural Heritage Program, working with conservation partners across the state to leverage invasive species data tools in efforts to protect New York's biodiversity. So I'll start by handing it off now to Addison. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction from both Jeff and Dan. I very much appreciate it. And without any further ado, I'm just gonna go ahead and dive right into the fun of it. I'm assuming you are, are all hearing my voice so far. All right, fantastic. As as was mentioned, uh, I am Addison Kubik, the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Capital Region PRISM. Uh, broadly speaking, there are eight PRISMs in New York State, each one focusing on a different region of the state, and each one funded by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and mine in particular is hosted within the Cornell Cooper Cooperative Extension of Saratoga County, so I'm based out of Boston Spa, and we work all over the place. And unsurprisingly, the main things that we do are about invasive species. We want to cultivate a region where everybody sort of has a, a stake in the matter. Everybody understands the role that they can play and can have a part in being a part of the solution. Because as I'm sure some of you have an idea, invasive species is not exactly a small, simple, or easy thing to try to understand. And what we do as a prism, just very briefly, is we coordinate all throughout the region to sort of, I think of us as the, the vascular system of invasive species information. I'm the hemoglobin that brings the oxygen of information to the muscles and to the organs where it needs to go. But now I'm just going to bring you some, some information oxygen. So obviously, if we want to talk about the problems of the invasive species in the Rensselaer Plateau, the first thing we have to do is talk about what an invasive species actually is. An invasive species, as is defined, generally speaking, is any non-native species, plant, animal, insect, pathogen, that can cause harm to the environment, the economy, human health, or broadly speaking, ecosystem health. 
And invasive species can come from all over the world. They can be from within one country, but just from a different part of it. They can be from America. They can be from Asia. It's a global problem, and we all are great at sharing invasive species with each other. And that last sentence is an important one to keep in mind. As international trade increases, the rate of invasive, invasive species introduction is basically guaranteed to increase. Now, what exactly is it about invasive species that is a problem? Why should you care about invasive species in the Rensselaer Plateau at all? Well, I'm glad you asked. Really, the problem, that, what it all boils down to at a baseline level is it affects biodiversity. And in my mind, biodiversity, an ecosystem with, that is biodiverse is an ecosystem that is stable and that is protected. If you have a a plot of land with a thousand different species on it, and then you have a pathogen that comes in and kills one of those species. Well, luckily, you'll still have 999 other species left there to maintain that ecosystem. But if you have a situation where that same plot of land and invasive species comes in, all of a sudden, there's only 10 species, and then a pathogen comes in and affects one of those, instead of having a 0.01% reduction in biodiversity, you have a 10% reduction in biodiversity. And as a system continues to degrade, the more susceptible it becomes to increase degradation, which is incredibly important when you think about ecosystems in particular, like the Rensselaer Plateau that have, in my estimation, some of the more in, definitely in the capital region, some of the more intact, healthier older growth forest systems, especially for hemlocks, which I will be talking about shortly. But it goes beyond just that. From a recreational perspective, invasive species reduce opportunities for recreation. It, make, it can make hiking harder. It can reduce fish populations. That also will come into play with the hemlocks in a little bit. Wildlife, tree species, and honestly, from my own perspective, it's very a non- it's, it can be very non-aesthetic to go to a forest that you love and then find it completely overrun with honeysuckle, barberry, one of these ugly invasive species that can just gum up the works of everything. And it's it's hard to sort of piece in your mind what invasive species can do, but in the U.S. alone, it's estimated to cost about $120 billion to deal with invasive species issues. And that number is actually from a study in 2005 and adjusted for 2024 dollars, that comes out to a little over $200 billion. And it could be even higher now, it probably is. And here on this picture are some invasive species that I'm hoping none of you have seen. Those two in the middle are the spotted lanternfly. That one up top is its nymphal stage, its last instar, and the one on the bottom is the adult. This is one that is not necessarily going to destroy the stability of your forests, but it might destroy the stability of your sanity. It is a very, very obnoxious human pest. If you if you know anybody who lives downstate or in Long Island or in Pennsylvania, the spotted lanternfly, the a tree will have thousands of them on it, and they'll just they 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 have a really high sugar intake, and their poop is called honeydew. And there's this thing that you can Google called honeydew rain, and it's exactly what it sounds like, but it's where a tree will have a thousand spotted lanternflies in it, and then they just rain down upon you a horrific precipitation of poop, which nobody wants to be involved with. And that's not even an economic cost, that's just an emotional cost. So we've got an invasive species. Let's break down to get some broader context for what everything else is. Obviously, you have your invasive species. The total other side of that coin is your native species. And obviously, this is anything that's indigenous to the region. And then you have your non-native species. And it's an important distinction to make that in all invasive species are non-native, but not all non-native species are invasive. It's an important distinction to make. Not everything that comes over here ends up going totally crazy. And then we have a nuisance species. This is something that most people will call a weed. That's your your crabgrass, and basically a weed is just anything that is growing where somebody does not want it to grow. It can be a native, it can be an invasive. If you don't like it there, then it's a weed to you. 
Next up, we have our ornamental species. This is how most of the invasive species arrived here in the first place. This is just something people put somewhere because they think it's pretty. This is where you get your oriental bittersweet spread a lot through, not necessarily as an ornamental species, but people would take the, the fruits and they would make reeds out of them, give them to everybody, and then wouldn't you know it, inside of a fruit is a seed, and then if you give seeds to other people, that can spread things around. Your naturalized species, that is something that has been planted intentionally, is not native, has escaped cultivation, and can now survive self-sustaining out in the wild. And then the biggest one to keep track of in your mind's eye is the sleeper species. This is something that is not invasive right now, but as the climate is warming and ranges are shifting, it could become invasive in the near future. That one's a really tricky thing because it's very predictive and it's hard to know what will or will not happen. So it's tricky, but that's something that we're always trying to keep an eye on. Watch as things change. Maybe this plant will have, maybe it'll grow a lot more this year than it did last year and we can evaluate that. Now, what characteristics does an invasive species have? How do you know what you're looking at is an invasive species? And most of these are pretty simple once you wrap your head around it. Most of them come from some other place. So they come over here and nothing in this ecosystem knows what they are or how to deal with them. So they'll have no predators, which obviously gives you a huge healthy competitive advantage. And if you have no predators, then you usually have a much higher reproductive success because there's less things eating you. Many things that become invasive species are generalist, meaning they don't eat just one specific plant. They can eat a whole bunch of things, which often, again, gives you an advantage over the natives. Another one, the extended growing season. That is a brutal one. Many invasive species, you'll see them start to come leafing out now in the early spring before any of the natives do. And then you'll also notice in the late fall, many things stay green much longer. Your bittersweets, especially your Asian bush honeysuckle, will just take over an understory and stay green well into November. Low nutritional value is also important. The Obviously, all of this leads into the greater population dispersal. Many of the plants have really high seed loads. And when you have a lot of seeds, that's a lot of reproductive capacity, which leads back into this whole cycle of invasive species. And one of the worst things that can happen is some of this stuff that you can see right here is a monoculture. And a monoculture is pretty simple. You think about the root of these words, mono, meaning one. A monoculture is just one species that has taken over an entire stand. And these pictures all represent some common invasive species to the area. The top right, that is a monoculture of garlic mustard, a very common invasive species that is very well known, not the most pressing to deal with. The next one in the top left, all of that red foliage you see, that is a very, very, very common ornamental plant still. That is winged euonymus or winged burning bush. Very, very common to see that in sh a shrub layer or a decorative around houses. And also very, very often it is you see seedlings escaping from those ornamental plantings into forest edges habitat, where once it gets into the forest edge, it can begin to push its way in, grows too fast, shades things out, has too many seeds, and it can destroy the next level of regeneration that all forests need to have. Because when an old tree dies, you want to have the next size class of trees ready to fill that gap. But if the understory is completely taken over by one of these other things, obviously that canopy gap, that light is then going to provide even more of a competitive advantage to these monocultures that exist under them because they're going to suck up all of that light and it's going to make them even more vigorous than they were before. And the burning bush is one of my biggest enemies. It is still very common. And the amount of times I've seen it in the Adirondacks, I have seen it off trail. I've seen it so many places. So if you do have it, I would love it if you got rid of it. Um, Lindera benzoin, northern spice bush, is a great alternative to that if you have it in your yard. Uh, it has, it goes yellow much earlier. It flowers before it 
leafs out so that's very pretty in the early spring and then it turns a beautiful golden color in the autumn and the leaves smell delicious when you crush them up but that's beside the point so these monocultures are basically what we want to avoid happening that down in the bottom left that is purple loose strife once the most common wetland plant in north america and not native but that has luckily also been there's three biocontrol beetles that sort of take care of the purple loose strife really well and then that one on the bottom right, if you've ever driven over the twin bridges, which I'm sure many of you have, you may have seen what I like to call the green monster. And that is a giant population of water chestnut, which is that picture on the bottom right. That is, believe it or not, what you're looking at is the top of a river that is completely overrun with water chestnut. I have seen small mammals cross rivers on beds of water chestnut before. It is bananas. And that's what we want to avoid. And in New York State, legislatively, invasive species fall into two categories. You're prohibited, which means you cannot knowingly possess with the intent to sell, import, purchase, transport, or introduce. And in addition, no person shall propagate prohibited invasive species. That is the more intense legislative version of these. And then you have your regulated species, which are species that cannot be knowingly introduced into a free living state or introduced by means that one should have known would lead to such an introduction. And these are things that are still commonly sold, but usually they will have a label on them in the nursery that says invasive. And again, it is my personal preference that you guys don't buy those. It's, it's ultimately up to you how to live your own life, but that's what I would prefer to you to do. That's the one of the best things you can do to protect the Rensselaer Plateau is to not buy invasive plants for your house and to do native plantings whenever you can. In New York, we rank invasive species mathematically to tell which ones are worth focusing on and which ones are not, because obviously it's a big issue and not everything is a four alarm fire, as my stepdad used to say. We, generally, the way they're broken down is if a score is higher than an 80, that is your very high category. That is the, the peak of prioritization. That is what I like to affectionately refer to as your ecological bullies, which is a, a phrase I stole from a Cornell researcher by the name of Baron Velossi. But basically, those are the things that are going to start causing damage fast and start causing damage that is going to be hard to replicate. And there are going to be two species in particular that I'm going to touch on at the end of my portion that are very, very important that could have very long lasting implications in particular to the plateau. And if you want to know about all of the invasive species that we know of in New York, and I'm sure Mitch will probably touch on this a little bit, I frequently use the New York State Invasive Species Tier System, and this will show you everything in the region. Highly recommend it, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that. In this invasion curve, I'm also not going to spend a crazy amount of time on this because it, I want to talk about plants and insects. But this basically shows you how we try to prioritize managing invasive species. If it isn't here yet in your tier one, obviously prevention is cheaper than anything else. If it's not here yet, it's always easier to keep something out than it is to keep something in. If it gets here, that's your tier two. That's when it's still in a small enough amount that you're like, okay, we can still go in here and get rid of it and eradicate it before it becomes a problem. That still obviously has a higher cost than prevention, but it's much lower than where things to get totally out of control. Unfortunately, not everything can be eradicated that simply, in which case it goes to a tier three species, which is the containment tier. And what that means is, okay, it's no longer feasible for it to be removed from this property. Now the focus is how do we keep it in here? Don't let it get out no matter what can happen. It's like me in the basement when I was a kid. Don't let it out no matter what. And then eventually, things can pass that stage, and that's when they become your tier four, your very, very widespread invasive species that they're not going to go anywhere. It becomes a matter of local protection. And that is your, your big things like Japanese knotweed, very common, been here for a very long time, Japanese barberry, um, phragmites. Most of the ones that have been here as ornamentals are just very widespread. But that widespread nature of it, it changes when you zoom in 
on a statewide landscape, some of these things may be tier four. But if you zoom in and focus just on maybe the Lorenzler Plateau in particular, maybe there are places where you're not going to get rid of it entirely, but maybe you can protect an asset, and that is the Rensselaer Plateau forests and trees. Maybe the work is worth the effort if you can do it somewhere where you're going to be effectively protecting something else, like your hemlock trees, which I will be talking about. And this is just to give you a quick example of some things and how they rate. Over there on the left, Oriental Bittersweet, I've mentioned that in the past, very, very high ranking. Uh, you can see in that picture on the top right of the Bittersweet just how many fruits one vine of that can has. And that is a very common feature of those invasives. Again, remember that the really high reproductive capacity or really fast growth. Bittersweet has both of those. In the middle, periwinkle. Technically invasive, yes, doesn't move very fast. I'm not losing any sleep over it. And then over there on the right, kudzu, the vine that ate the south. And if you've ever driven through Virginia in the spring or in the summer, oh my goodness gracious, it's it lives up to the name. But luckily, up in this area, it's not really that big of a threat yet. So it's still in that tier two category, which means eradication is potential, which is ideal. And now I'm going to get into the actual fun stuff, depending on your perspective, because it's kind of depressing. In my opinion, there is no more important tree in the Rensselaer Plateau than the eastern hemlock. And there is no greater threat to the eastern hemlock than the hemlock woolly adelgid. And I'm going to move on to this slide, but I'm going to just talk really quickly about what makes the hemlock so important. The hemlock is what we call a foundational species. And what that means is that the hemlock, the hemlocks themselves sort of create the, the environmental conditions which have become really synonymous with them. A, if you ever walk into a hemlock stand on a hike, you'll notice that immediately a hemlock stand is much shadier than any other forest stand is going to be. And then you walk into the hemlock stand and whether it be summer or winter, you will feel the temperature drop five to 10 degrees as soon as you walk into the hemlock stand. That is a guarantee. I've, it's happened to me a bunch of times. And what these conditions do is they provide a lot of really important habitat for things like fun wildflowers. Uh, trout lilies grow really well under uh, hemlock trees. Uh, ghost pipe grows really well under hemlock trees. There's a lot of species of birds that require hemlock trees, warblers, uh, wrens, hermit thrushes, one of my favorite birds. And in addition, if I don't know if you're a fisherman, but brook trout is heavily dependent on eastern hemlock trees because not only do hemlock trees shade provide excess shade to the rivers to keep the stream's temperatures lower, the branches of hemlocks are so shady that they hold snow much longer than any other species does, which significantly slows the rate of snow runoff into streams in the spring and into the summer, which keeps the, the stream's temperatures even colder for an even longer period of time. And what HWA is, the hemlock woolly adelgid, is uh, a non-native insect very similar to an aphid that's got a, a straw-like mouthpiece. And they basically, they jab their straw-like mouthpiece piece into the base of the needle on the underside of the leaves, and they just, they drink their fill for their entire life while they're there. And that feeding cuts off the supply of nutrients to the actual foliage. It, it prevents the tree from being able to grow new growth in the spring season, which eventually unsurprisingly leads to eventual tree death. Because if a tree can't photosynthesize, then a tree can't live. And the problem with that is hemlock trees are very, very slow growing trees. Mature hemlock trees can live for three, four, 500 years. And if you lose one in 20 years, that is not something that you are capable of replacing once it has been removed. And the way you can look for hemlock woolly adelgid, and I will say this right now, right now is not a good time to go looking for it because they're starting to lay their eggs. And this is when you can accidentally move them between trees. But you see that picture in the middle that shows you the white woolly masses that are always going to be on the twig itself never on the needle, and they'll always be at the base of the twig. 
And that's how you know HWA is feeding on the tree. That is the, pre the, the presence of their egg sacs. This shows a little bit more. Interestingly enough, HWA is also native to the Pacific Northwest, but the HWA that is here is not from that lineage. It's actually from a Japanese-like lineage. But as the temperatures have begun to warm, traditionally the colder temperatures in the higher plateau and up into the northern Adirondacks have been able to suppress HWA populations from moving farther into those colder climates. But as those climates are getting warmer, that slow progression march of HWA is continuing to increase. So surveying for a hemlock woolly delgid, if you're ever if you're ever out and you see hemlocks around, just check the branches for them. This picture on the right shows you what a close-up of the hemlock needles look like underneath. They're very distinct to all other conifers. They've got these really charismatic white stomatal bands that are on the underside of the needles. And all the needles are going to be, they come out parallel from one another on or opposite one another along the twig. And every once in a while, needles will be perpendicular to the rest growing on top of the twig. So look for the, the two rank needles with those white stomatal bands. That's how you know you've got a hemlock tree. And when you grab one, grab a branch down, you're going to want to look at the underside of the branch. And I do like to check personally using hemlock protocols, three random branches on a tree is what I would check to see if I can see any HWA egg masses. That picture down on the middle of the screen, that shows you what they are like in their halo stage. Each one of those is what they actually look like, but they're about the size of a sesame seed to the naked eye. So they're very tough to see in that stage. So generally the egg masses, the white woolly egg masses are the easiest thing to look for. And Mitch is gonna tell you about how you can report some of those things very shortly. But what you want to look for, if you see a hemlock tree and its its needles have a grayish tinge, you don't see a lot of the new growth. And that new growth is very obvious in the springtime because it's a very bright lime green compared to a, a darker foresty green that the regular needles tend to be. The lack of new growth is the biggest one. And that grayish tinge to the foliage, which you can kind of see in that picture on the top right, that can give you an idea that something might be amiss. And that's something you want to go look for. And if you see any symptoms of HWA, or even if you're not sure, it's always better to report if you're not sure than to not report. Because worst case scenario, you'll send it in and somebody who knows better will be like, oh, nothing to worry about. We're all fine. And that is the first of the major things to look for. And the second one is significantly more worrying if you didn't think that was possible. So the other thing that is really important, in my opinion, to look for, and this is not true of just the Rensselaer Plateau, but really most New York forests as a whole, beech is one of the most common trees in New York State forests, and beech leaf disease is a relatively new pathogen that was discovered in 2012 with a causal link to a nematode from the Pacific Rim that is one of the most virulent and worrisome forest pests in my personal opinion you may be aware of beech bark disease beech bark disease is a different invasive species it's a complex of two different things actually but it it kills trees but beech bark disease it only kills the above ground portion of the tree the root system will survive and it will send up suckers with beech leaf disease what what looks like is actually happening is the nematodes in the leaves they they do something that is causing it causing a thickening of the the mesophyll tissue in the leaf which prevents the trees from again from photosynthesizing and unlike with beech bark disease which only kills the above ground portion of the tree but leaves the roots alive beech leaf disease kills the entire tree and not only does it kill the entire tree it kills the tree much faster than beech bark disease would kill the tree Older trees with beech leaf disease will typically die within six to 10 years. Understory trees die within usually two to three years, which is especially problematic when you think about beech bark disease essentially turns large mature beech trees that kills the above ground portions and replaces them with a large amount of sapling regrowth from the root systems. So what you have is a disease that removes large mature trees and replaces them with 
many understory thickets, and then you have a second disease that kills both old class trees and young class trees, but kills the young ones significantly faster. So this is something that is mildly terrifying. Right now, nobody really knows what the solution is. We don't know its exact methods of spread. So this is one that is absolutely vitally important to be surveying for, and luckily it is very, very easy to survey for. When you're going out hiking, you will see beech trees. They are very, very common trees. They, when they don't have beech bark disease, they are, they have this really smooth silvery bark and these really distinct leaves with this, probably one of the best textbooks examples of a pinnate venation in a leaf. And when you think of pinnate venation, think of the birds of a feather or the feathers of a bird rather. And the way that they spread from a central point, you can see in the central picture that, that you've got the central, center mid vein and then really conspicuous parallel leaves going up or opposite leaves going up, opposite veins in the leaf going up from the mid rim. And the key symptom for beech leaf disease is a thickening of that zone in between the, the leaf veins. You can see in that middle picture, there are several intercostal areas that are much darker and those represent the diseased tissue. And this disease symptom will be on the leaf from bud break until leaf senescence. So it'll be on, if the tree, if the leaf is symptomatic, it will be symptomatic for the entirety of the leaf's existence on the tree. And that, that darkening is the best thing to look for. And the best way to look for it is as you're walking through the trail, just scan up with your head while you're walking. The sunlight above you does a great job of adding a, a light contrast to the top of the leaves. And you can see it on that picture on the bottom left. That is just a picture looking straight up at some beech leaves. And you can see that really significant intercostal darkening of the, of the leaf tissue. And eventually, as the disease progresses, the leaves will start to become leathery, which you can see in that the top leftmost picture. Beech leaves typically have a very distinct papery feel to them. And that leathery feeling is a significant consequence of the prolonged disease presence. And then eventually, if you start to see leaves falling off of beech trees early, that is a very, very telltale sign. Because there are few trees which hold their leaves longer than beech trees. You could go out into the forest right now and almost every beech is still going to be holding its leaves onto them. They hold them well through the winter. And then quickly, these are just a handful of common lookalikes which you might see while you're out looking for beech leaf disease. And I'm just going to go through these quickly. Uh, the beech rolling aphid that you can see on those pictures on the left, the key differentiator between those and beech leaf disease is that the damage, as you see on those beech rolling aphid leaves, is actually the thinning of leaf tissue by feeding. So that can make some of the places look thicker, but that's just because comparatively they're, the normal ones have been fed on. And that is very obvious once you have it in your hands. You realize that it's not been thickened. It's actually been munched on even more. The anthracnose. That's just the browning that moves in. Anthracnose is a very common general tree pathogen it's not going to have that thickening but if you have it in the canopy the light can play a trick and make you think that it's thicker than it is from a distance but once you can get a closer look at it it's usually very obvious the irinium patch mites similar thing where that is actually skeletonization of the leaf tissue and not actually a thickening of the rest of it and then the picture on the right is a a feature of beech trees called marcescence and that is just their tendency to hold their leaves on well through the winter as, I believe, an anti-herbivory tactic from deer browsing on their very conspicuous buds. And after that series of rants, that is all I have for all of you right now. And I guess I can hand it over to Mitch if there aren't any burning questions. I'm going to stop. We don't have any questions in the chat. I seem to have lost my ability to share. Can you 
maybe you have to remake me a host or something. Sorry about that. I'm on it. That's okay. That was I had a connectivity problem for a couple minutes in the middle. You should be good now, Mitch. Okay, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mitch. So thanks, Addison, for that great overview of um, all, all these many different invasive species and the issues that come with them. Um, and so one of the, the things, there's a lot, a lot of things that go into invasive species management. Um, so preventing them and actually doing the physical management. Um, but one important thing that many of you could partake in is helping build our understanding of where invasive species are. So reporting them when you see them um, so that people like Addison have better maps and better information on where these species are um, so that they can figure out what to do about them. So to start, I just wanted to, to tell you a little about my the organization I work for. So I work for the New York Natural Heritage Program our mission is to facilitate the conservation of New York's biodiversity, uh, mostly by providing information. So a lot of my coworkers survey the state and map our rare plants and animals and natural communities. Um, so a lot of what we do is really centered around data on rare native species, but uh, invasive species are one of the largest and most immediate threats to many rare plants, animals, and natural communities across the state. So the New York Natural, natural Heritage Program has also been tasked with uh, managing the invasive species database for the state. So we also have um, an invasive species program at the New York Natural Heritage Program where we administer IMAP invasives for um, partners across the state, like the Capital Region Prism. And so who is IMAP for? Um, so like one of the first users we might think of would be PRISM staff or the state agencies. So conservation professionals across the state use IMAP invasives to see where invasive species are and track their surveys all in one place and track their management efforts. Um, so one of our big user groups is, of course, uh, professional uh, people in the conservation field. Um, but um really imap invasives is for everyone so addison works for the capital region prism which covers kind of those many counties um and addison can't battle all the invasive species in that area alone so we always welcome help so we know that across the state there are so many people who are outdoors and who love the natural areas they go to visit people are out hiking in the winter and in the summer and paddling in the summer as well. Um, and many of you all know your natural areas very well and will notice when something new arrives or the trees start dying suddenly. So we always like uh, sharing this message to, to outdoor enthusiasts um, and really just anyone um, so that you can check for invasive species while you're out on the trail, or you can go out somewhere and look for invasive species that are of concern in that area. So I thank everyone for joining this, this webinar and just listening to us talk about this because um, your, the records that are input by volunteers are very important. And there are many cases where the first, uh, you know, like the first Hamaglia Delgid found in on a certain island in Lake George that happened a few years ago, just by someone who is camping and happened to have I, the IMAP Invasives app and reported it. So thank you all. And so for the, the rest of my time, I'm gonna give a quick run through of kind of how IMAP Invasives works. Um, just to, to stay on time, we won't go through every detail and have you follow along and everything. So mostly I'll just kind of run through how you can expect things to look. And I'll also point you to some resources you can follow later on. Um, so you should be uh, well prepared to, to try to get set up with IMAP invasives after this call whenever you get a chance over the next few days or weeks. Um, and you can always feel free to reach out if there are any issues. So the first thing to do is to set up an IMAP invasives account. 
And our website is at nyimapinvasives.org. And you can, well, you can look at the information on our website, but the, the main thing is the login button on the top right. That's where you can create an account. So that brings you to our login page and there's a big sign up box. So you just put in your information or if you already have an account, you can just log in or reset your password if you need to. If you don't have an account, you can create that. So just put in your information, um, the email you want to use, the password you want to use, and select New York for your jurisdiction. So IMAP is actually used by a couple of different states and provinces in the US and Canada. Um, but for New York, we have like certain species tracked. Um, so, so pick New York. And also, um, another important thing to note is that once you hit join, your account is created, but your account isn't usable yet. So it'll show you a message um, about this, but just to forewarn you, um, you'll hit join and then it will trigger an activation email uh, to your inbox. So that's just to verify your, your email and that you signed up for this. So make sure you check your email and activate your account so that you'll be able to use it. Um, and if you don't see that in your your inbox, it's usually pretty quick, like within five minutes, but if you don't see it, um, it might be in your spam box or your junk folder. So check there um, and feel free to reach out if you can't find it. Um, but once you, you have activated your account, um, you'll be able to log in. And for, for the most part, I'll be talking about how to report um, using our mobile app. So you don't necessarily need to use the online interface, but I'll just give you a quick look um, at what the online interface is in case you're interested. So when you log in, it brings you to the map and you can see there's data in some other areas of North America as well. Um, but you can zoom into New York if you wanna see what's going on here. And there's all sorts of stuff going on the screen. So. In the top left, there's the main menu. That's where you can look at the species list for the state or look at your account information, that sort of stuff. On the left hand side, that's how you pan around or zoom in and out on the map or enter in your town in the search uh, bar. On the top are some action tools, like if you want to create a record or filter on a species that you want to see where it is, like you want to see where hemlock leadelgia is or something, you can do that in the filter tool. And then on the, on the right, you can toggle on the layers um, that you want. So this is uh, most useful for like if you're at home on your computer and you want to see what invasive species are in your area or something. Um, but for, for reporting species that you find while you're out on the plateau, we'd really recommend the mobile app. Uh, so that is designed for when you are out in the field and you may or may not have connectivity. Um, this allows you to collect data on your phone and then submit it once you're, you're back home and you have internet. So just search IMAP invasives in your App Store or on Google Play. Um, and it's just to, to give you a, an idea of the workflow. Uh, you basically just download the app and then you set up your preferences. So mainly that involves just selecting your state, putting in your username and password, and then pressing this green button. Um, and once you've done that, you should get a success message and then you're pretty much good to go. And of course you need to uh, it's best to do that uh, maybe before you go out and you expect to be looking for invasive species because this is all faster and easier when you're at home and you have internet and the lighting's good and your fingers aren't too cold to go on the screen and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then at that point, once you have pressed that retrieve IMAP list button, you are good to go and report invasive species. So what that looks like is when you when you find an invasive you open the app and you go to this add observation button on the top right and that brings you up to a screen where you enter in information so you can add a photo which we always recommend 
Um, it's really helpful for people reviewing the records uh, to be able to verify your record easily if you take a nice photo and you select the species, whether or not you found it or not. So we do have an option, say you went uh, on the trail and you went to a bunch of hemlocks and you checked three branches and you didn't find any egg masses, you can, um, you can still report that effort because you've just uh, spent time uh, doing something that's very useful for us and that information is good to have. So you can put a not detected record for hemlock gliadelgid. Um, and there's also, there'll also be a map in here if you scroll down farther. So it, it captures a point uh, based on your cell phone GPS. And so you can go out on the field, go out on the field and maybe you have, you have very bad service, um, but you're, you, you'll be able to record as many observations as you want and those will all be saved on your phone. And then once you get back home and you have internet connection again, that's when you can upload those records um, to the database. So when they're all saved on your phone, um, while you're out on the trail, you, you can see all those, but someone like Addison won't be able to see those yet. So it's really important to remember to upload those records at the end of the day um, so that they can be used. And you basically do that just by going to the main menu and choosing that upload selected button. So you can check off the records that you want to send in. And I'll just put in another plug for good pictures. So uh, the best pictures tend to be close up enough that you can see some sort of identifying feature and clear enough that you can clearly see that feature. So with these two photos, um, they're actually of Tree of Heaven. And if you know Tree of Heaven really well, you might be able to tell, like you can kind of see the blurry leaf scar on the left or on the right, you can kind of see how the, like the, the, some unique things about the branching patterns and how everything's kind of growing up. But really, you can't really tell. It just kind of looks like twigs. Um, and if you really wanted to be able to figure it out, you would really have to like zoom in and look at it for a long time. Um, but with this photo on the right, it's clear. Um, it, you can see the leaf scars, um, and that's a distinctive thing about uh, Tree of Heaven. They kind of look like hearts with this little thing in the middle. Um, so if it's, if it's close up and clear, um, that makes, makes it a lot easier for people to review the record. Um, another thing that can help is a sense of scale. So sometimes you can put your hand behind a leaf or something or a piece of paper behind the leaf, and that will it will also help your camera focus, um, but it'll also give some scale so you can sell, tell how large or small the leaf is. Um, and we do understand like the, maybe it's raining, maybe the wind is blowing, like we're not expecting like great photography all the time. Um, just kind of do the best you can. Um, yeah, and then just a couple more tips. Um, I just want to remind everyone to make sure you activate your account after you create it, um, because if you just create it and don't activate it, you'll run into issues when you get into the mobile app, like you'll get an error message that your account's not working, that sort of thing. Um, and then for the mobile app, a couple tips, um, just a reminder to make sure you set your preferences. So the most important part is putting in your information and clicking that retrieve IMAP lists button. Um, but another thing to mention is that you can set up a custom species list. So our list is very long. Um, so you kind of have to scroll through lots of species. So it's, it's a good idea to set up a custom list so you can pick out, you know, three or four species that you're familiar with, maybe hemlock gliadelgid and beech leaf disease and some of the other species Addison has mentioned today. So if you pick those, um, then when you go and when you're out and creating records, you'll just have a very short list of, you know, the five species that you're actually looking for. Um, so it'll make it a lot quicker for you to create those records. Um, another tip, we have a species in the database called a fake species. And I use that a lot and 
a lot of lots of new users use that to kind of test out how the data entry works. Um, so you can kind of go through the full process and make sure you understand it before you go out on the trail. So feel free to enter as many fake species records as you want. They we we have that as an option on purpose. It won't mess up the database or anything. Um, so that's a good option to just test things out. And um, a reminder that uh, if you are doing surveys and not finding the, the plants that you're doing a targeted search for, um, we are happy to accept those not detected records as well. And then last reminder, remember to upload your records at the end of the day. So if you open your app and you see those that list of records, that means they're like sitting on your phone and um, nobody else can see or use those records. So please remember to upload those. And um, so I know I went through a lot of that fast. Um, so so uh, hopefully that, that helps you kind of know what to expect so that you'll be able to, to do this easily later on. But also we do have a lot of resources that you can use to guide you through it. So we have a lot of self-guided resources, for example, um, on YouTube, there are videos that go through how to do the different steps. So I encourage you to use those and you can always contact us if anything's going wrong or you just need some guidance. Um, and just a, a plug for some of the other capabilities in IMAP, none of these are uh, required of any of you. They're just kind of if you're interested. So. Just to let some of you know, you can set up email alerts for areas or species of interest. Um, you can use the interface to view data, um, view where certain species are. Um, and if any of you are doing uh, more advanced work, like you're doing treatments or you are um, kind of doing complex surveys where you're delineating different patches of invasive species and stuff, um, let us know because there are some other options. I focused on the mobile app today because that's really great for quick observations, um, just a quick point to show where you found an invasive species. Um, more, more complex information isn't really necessary unless you're doing that sort of work. Um, and if you want to learn more, um, I encourage you to go to our website. We do have a training page with lots of resources. And we do a, a webinar each month, um, the last Wednesday of the month at 1 p.m. And there are other trainings that happen throughout the state on occasion. And with that, I welcome any questions and I thank you all so much for listening and feel free to, to keep in touch so you can email us or follow us on social media. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, does anybody have any uh, questions for our speakers? We do have I, one question in the text chat there, Jeff. Pardon me? We do have one question in the chat. Oh, OK. Uh, I see that. Uh, I am recently seeing fields of multiflora rose plants infected with rose rosette disease. Do you think the disease will suppress or eradicate multiflora invasion? My gut instinct is on its own, probably not. Only I have, it's, it's, I'll be honest with you, this is a cynical line of work. And I, uh, oftentimes I have the, uh, the, the opinion that basically boils down to, I'll believe it when I see it and I would love to be wrong. I would love to be surprised, but I I don't anticipate it. But I'm sure we'd all love to be proven wrong on that. So <laughs> yeah, there there are a few things I would like to be wrong on more than this stuff. <laughs> I have a question if I could just ask it verbally <clears throat> instead of typing it in. Um, the 
Beach, obviously beach trees are, first of all, thank you both for your work and for the presentation. The beach trees are obviously already really struggling. So I'm wondering about the concern for this specific um, issue with the leaves, why that takes precedent over some of the others. And if you spoke to that and I missed it, I apologize. The, so the, 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 there's, a, there's several things at play. One is that beaches in of themselves are one of a handful of mask producing tree species in, um, in New York. So they provide super duper critical food for wildlife in particular your hibernators like your black bear and to sort of i don't remember if i said it specifically or not but beach bark disease which has been just battering beaches for decades at this point it batters them but it doesn't kill them and it allows them to still produce fruits and seeds although not as high of levels as they would if they were fully healthy and fully mature still it's more than nothing but beech leaf disease kills the entire tree can't regrow no saplings can happen and one of the many worries with the potential extirpation of beaches from new york state is that if those trees in those forest stands aren't replaced with other mass producing species like oaks which in and of itself, the thought of the scale of a project like that to try to replace mass-producing beaches and forests with other mass-producing species is bananas. But the like the black bear would likely no longer be able to exist in New York without beech trees providing all of the mast, and that bleeds into and that has a whole set of cascading events that can happen afterwards. I don't know. Does that help um, elucidate the the threat and sweat of my heart about beech leaf disease? Absolutely. And the difference between the beech bark disease and the beech leaf disease. And it's, um, yeah, very informative. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for asking. We have another this question. matters if you guys don't care. We have one more question here. Um, it says, we have honeysuckle growing along the edges of my property. It's a habitat for birds and protection from neighbors. But should I be ruthless and cut it out? I also have a pretty buckthorn, but I think I should take it out. I would, they, they, the birds do love them, but honeysuckles do, they fundamentally provide less nutrition for the birds that feed on them the the berries have less fat less proteins than the native berries do and a lot of that we haven't really fully seen to understand what the effects of that are going to be especially for migratory birds that need certain that have spent thousands of years in these evolutionary cadences with these very specific dietary intakes that have suddenly changed rapidly over the past hundred years we don't know what the effects of that could be Long term, I personally, I would, and here's why, honeysuckle of all the invasive species is not the most difficult in the world to remove. You can you can cut it back one year and then come back the next year and pull out the root balls. They'll be significantly weakened than they would be for you to try to do the whole plants all at once. And then I would just try to replace them with a, a more wildlife productive bush um eastern nine bark is a uh is a native shrub that i like it's one that i often recommend people replace japanese barberry with but it can have a couple of different colors it has really pretty purple leaves and it provides a bunch of ecosystem benefits that is my take on honeysuckle are there uh, a variety of honeysuckles i mean i, I think there are several different there are there's there, there are some native honeysuckles, and they're also, broadly speaking, the, what we call the Asian bush honeysuckles. It's a, it's a handful of different species, but they're all, they all functionally act the same, and the differences between them are very minute. A really quick and dirty way to tell if you are dealing with an invasive or a native honeysuckle, if you cut the twig, 
the the pith is a little section of in the center of a twig. If you cut uh, an invasive honeysuckle, the pith is hollow, and on a native honeysuckle, the pith is not hollow. So that is the fastest way you can tell if you are dealing with a native versus a non-native honeysuckle. And there's also Japanese honeysuckle, which is more of a vine, less of a bush. We won't get into that too much right now. You know, uh, up on the plateau, we've got a lot of Tartarian honeysuckle, which is invasive. Yes, it is. It's on my hit list. We are at time, so we're going to have to leave it there for tonight. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Addison and Mitchell, for those really super informative presentations. Everyone have a great night, and we will hopefully see you next month. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us.